the members that are present in the room. We have Christopher, Trevor, Lon, Doug and Martina in the room and at this stage we have Pat and Emma by phone. Is there anybody else on the phone? Okay, so at this stage we've just, we're just missing George and uh, Trevor Clark but if we hear the beeps on the phone we'll know that it's, it's one or other of them. So as ever, we're uh, currently being broadcast live through the Parliament building and on the website and any phones, just as long as they're not beside the microphones in case they cause an interference. So if we head on to apologies, we haven't received any <coughs> apologies yet for today. No. Uh, draft minutes are currently um, uh, on page five of the meeting pack. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings? Yep. Okay, then we'll have those signed. Uh, matters arising, from my perspective, there are no matters arising. Is there anything for any members wish to discuss? Okay, um, so we're going to invite in a moment in the uh, junior ministers from the executive office to discuss the withdrawal agreement joint committee, um, which is in the tabled papers. Um, we. Uh, did uh, the committee had also just to say that we had? Oh, I'll be wait to the end for this bit, will I? Oh, you're okay. Go ahead. Just the committee had also asked for information about the specialised committee. Um, this was the one that Andrew McCormick referred to when he was with us two or three mm. weeks ago that he was attending. Um, but we haven't received anything from them at this stage. But in your pack is the readout that has come from the uh, various. Uh, from the EU and from the UK side, so that's available in the table packs um, for people to reference. There are other relevant pages can be found at page 11 of the meeting pack as well. So, and there were suggested questions that were sent round as well for people uh, following one of our previous conversations. So, um, that is also available for Thanks. members to work their way through. Now, there we go. We're, we're, we've powered through the first bits of our committee, which we tend to do, so we're, we're ready for you. Um, worry, there we go. I was worried we'd make these you behind the seat. I'll set up here. Uh, I think it's a bit too close yeah. to Trevor and Doug there, so, okay, um, no and problem. it does make it feel a bit more like you're back at school, <laughs> sitting at an individual table back there, so um, we'll, we'll let you settle there just to keep everybody safe. Um, Maybe we could get the two chairs removed. Yeah, maybe just two, yeah, because yeah. they're they're kind of in your way, but there would. Yes, that would. Ah, yeah, the that does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, ministers, you're very welcome along today to give us the um, update on your attendance at the joint. Um, Joint Committee um, from the Withdrawal Agreement Joint Committee, which you attended a number of weeks ago. Um, just to maintain the theme, if you could bring the message back, uh, we did ask for a paper in relation to the Specialised Committee, which is what the, I think the layer below the Joint Committee, and that your officials had attended about two weeks ago, um, but we haven't received anything. Uh, from them at this stage, so if there was a possibility of relaying a message back that we're still waiting on some information there. Um, maybe if I could pass over to yourselves then, if you want to maybe, just in the usual format, if you want to make a short presentation and then we'll ask questions from there. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's good to be here and to be able to um, update the committee specifically on the um, joint committee meeting of the 30th of March. However, I'm sure that it will be the case that we might talk about um, joint committee issues uh, more widely, and we're happy to do that uh, and fill you in on the work that we have been uh, engaged in uh, around the, the joint committee. Um, I just want to say from the from the outset, with we'll some opening opening comments, and then we'll 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 then move into the um, the, the specific update to, to the meeting. But we do want to put on record the fact that we do value the role of this committee in scrutinising uh, the work of the executive regarding the UK's exit from the EU. Uh, we're grateful that you are fulfilling the role uh, of scrutiny envisioned in the um, New Decade uh, New Approach document, which specifically recognised the interest of all of the political parties in Northern Ireland around the uh, work on Brexit with um, a, a subcommittee uh, with all five of the executive parties represented. And we want to engage 
uh, as fully uh, as possible um, with you while, of course, um, respecting the usual um, principles in and around the um, confidential nature and conduct of, of executive business. And in addition, the, the Joint Committee and um, its official level subordinate fora are also um, going to be subject to confidentiality and therefore I hope you will um, understand that there are limits uh, on what it is that we're going to be able to, to say. Um, I don't for one second um, suspect that that will stop you from asking the questions, but I hope that you can um, understand why we might not be able to, um, to give us full some um, answers. Declan. Thanks, Gordon. And we have a few remarks uh, to make um, just at the outset, and we'll, we'll, we'll alternate. Uh, the committee has had the opportunity to be briefed regularly by uh, TEO officials, and uh, you've also received some written briefings. Uh, so, of course, to reinforce Gordon's point, we do want to ensure that that type of strong engagement continues and that it's improved on by sharing material and answering questions as fully as we or our officials can. And that most recent oral briefing took place on the 29th of April, which was the day before the Specialised Committee. And it focused on progress on both uh, the negotiations on the uh, British Government EU future relationship, as well as the discussions on the implementation of the protocol itself. Both very important issues, uh, and the Executive is fully committed to ensuring that we get the best possible outcomes for all of our citizens and for the regional economy, as that also extends into the uh, island economy. We understand, uh, that is myself and Gordon, that the discussion covered a range of issues and that the committee was keen to have some more detailed information on a number of key points, uh, extending to the change in arrangements on the Brexit subcommittee, EU funding, uh, common frameworks and the democratic consent mechanism. And you are going to receive uh, written briefing on all of those issues and where there has been uh, a delay in getting some of that material to you. Uh, we apologise and, and I spoke with officials earlier on today to establish the point at which we were at, ensuring that you would get that material. Given what's already been discussed in the committee to date, uh, it is fitting that we focus today, in line with your invitation, in more detail on the engagement that we have had on the implementation of the protocol through the Joint Committee on the Withdrawal Agreement. So at that point, Colin, I'm going to let uh, Gordon speak to the issue of the Joint Committee meeting. Okay, so Mr Chairman, as you'll be aware, the New Decade New Approach document committed the UK Government um, to sending uh, or allowing representatives from the Northern Ireland Executive um, to be uh, invited to be part of the UK delegation in any meetings of the UK EU specialised or joint committees discussing Northern Ireland specific matters at which um, representatives from the Republic of Ireland Government are also there um, as part of the EU delegation. And so Minister Kearney and I joined that meeting on the 30th of March um, and we welcomed the opportunity to represent the Northern Ireland uh, Executive at that first meeting of the um, Joint Committee on the Withdrawal Agreement, um, which, um, as you can understand, had to be held uh, by teleconference. I think it might be helpful, first of all, to um, say a little bit about the remit of the Joint Committee and the nature uh, of its work. It was created, as you'll be aware, under the terms of the um, Withdrawal Agreement, Article 164, and it's responsible for the implementation and application of all aspects of the Withdrawal Agreement. So it covers citizens' rights, the detailed outworkings of the UK's involvement in EU programmes, and a wide range of other issues, uh, including the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. There are also six specialised committees that then report to the Joint Committee, uh, and they cover citizens' rights, finance, uh, Gibraltar, the sovereign bases in Cyprus, and other separate separation provisions, uh, as well as the specialised committee on the Ireland-Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, in practice, the Joint Committee is not going to have the same degree uh, of attention given to um, uh, each of these six aspects of work, uh, and Minister Kearney and I were invited uh, to the first meeting because there was significant interest uh, from all concerned in relation to uh, issues to do with the protocol. Uh, so therefore, the Joint Committee is a key forum for decision making on how the protocol is to be implemented. The committee will provide the opportunity for discussion and agreement on any issue raised by the EU and UK relating to implementation. 
There are also four issues specified for decision by the Joint Committee and the Protocol itself. First of all, aspects uh, of the applicability or otherwise of tariffs. Can I just check who that is in case it's somebody that's not meant to be? Here? That's fine. Can I just check who's either joined or left us there on the phone? Oh, it's George here. All right, George, you're very oh. welcome. We're just in the middle of the presentation from the junior ministers. That's OK. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, continue there. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and, and good to hear from you, uh, George, as well. Uh, I was just explaining in relation to the, the Joint Committee, they have, um, there's four specific aspects that they have um, to, to consider. Uh, the first is the applicability of tariffs or otherwise um, for goods that are coming to Northern Ireland that may be at risk of going into the EU. Uh, agriculture support, uh, fisheries and um, decisions around EU oversight of the UK's implementation of the protocol. So it's critically important to us that any uh, provision of the protocol is imp implemented in a way that causes the least amount uh, of friction north-south and um, east-west. So the withdrawal agreement specifies the basis for decision making and the remit of the joint committee and also how many um, uh, how there may be, be disagreements uh, between the two sides and how those uh, might be resolved. So the meeting on the 30th of March was co-chaired by the European Commission and the UK, and the Irish government was also represented at official level, as were another, uh, a number of other member states uh, as part of the EU delegation. The focus of the meeting was to start work in a number of areas relating to the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, including the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. And I made it very clear uh, in my intervention that the most important issue from our point of view, and, and this is one that's shared across the, the political spectrum here in Northern Ireland, is that the withdrawal agreement must be implemented in a way that secures the best outcome for our citizens and uh, for our economy. In, in terms of my own intervention at that particular meeting, I welcomed the commitment that the executive would be directly involved and engaged uh, in the work of the specialised committee on the protocol and also the joint consultative working group itself. It, it's important that we're all fully engaged in the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, which, and it doesn't need to be said here, but I will for the record, it has unique and ma major significance for everyone in this region. It's also important to recall that the withdrawal agreement and the protocol prevent any question of a hard border between North and South. It seeks to safeguard the all-island economy and, of course, all dimensions and elements of the Good Friday Agreement. But the protocol also preserves the integrity of the EU single market and consumers and businesses here are going to benefit through having access to that and its protections. It also, at the same time, maintains the North's position in relation to the uh, British government's uh, customs territory. And the clear intention is that exporters here in this region would be able to benefit from future free trade agreements between the British government and other countries across the world if one, in fact, is developed. At the meeting, the European Commission explained that it is seeking uh, further clarity and a very detailed timetable from the British government on the necessary measures to ensure full implementation and adherence to the protocol. We are engaged with the British Government on the promises that they have made on uh, the issues that are under their control. And the Joint Committee endorsed a decision to establish the Specialised Committee, which Gordon spoke of, which will become the forum for more detailed uh, discussions on the issues where the Joint Committee has still to make decisions as set out in the protocol itself. I also emphasised at that meeting that there is agreement across the Executive, uh, notwithstanding differences on other issues, in uh, relation to what we are seeking from this particular process. We need to minimise the barriers to trade in all directions and secure clarity and certainty for our businesses, whether their relationships are north and south or east and west, or indeed going in each direction. We also need to ensure that the outcome reinforces the rights and the expectations of all of our people as provided for under the Good Friday Agreement. And that extends to the protection of employment rights, the environment and, of course, the most vulnerable in our society. And I also welcome the opportunity con to contribute and look forward to a, a future constructive and positive engagement on all of those issues, especially as the more detailed discussions take place 
on the decisions which will have to be made by the Joint Committee itself. So, to, re to reiterate, the four issues identified in the protocol that require discussion and agreement at the Joint Committee level relate to the goods which are brought into the North from outside the EU that are considered quote unquote, not at risk of moving into the EU, and Gordon has touched on this. That's Article 5 of the protocol. The conditions for customs exemption for fishery and aquaculture products, and they relate to a, a separate subset of the protocol. The maximum exempted overall annual level of agricultural support, which is reflected in Article 10 of the protocol, and then the detailed arrangements for governance of all of that as provided for under Article 12 of the Protocol. And we expect that both the British Government and the EU will seek to convene a further meeting of the Joint Committee later in June, where it would be our expectation that the Executive would once again be represented. June is going to be a pivotal month in the discussions between the British Government and the EU, because we will at that stage be into a six-month countdown to uh, the conclusion of this transition period. That meeting of the Joint Committee is likely to be the point at which any consideration of an extension of the transition period would take place, given the deadline of the 30th of June to request an extension. So we are into a countdown of seven weeks through until that per period, and that, that indicates then a six-month countdown to the end of the year. There will also be a UK and a uh, an EU stock take of future relationship negotiations in June, and that will assess progress after four rounds of negotiations, which should have taken place by that point. The third round is taking place this week, and there will be a fourth round, which would commence uh, on the 1st of June. Touch on the specialised committee. Would you like an update? Um, I think you did get a briefing on the specialised committee, but I'm more than happy just to, to reinforce um, that the um, Northern Ireland Ireland specialised committee held its first meeting on the 30th of April, and the meeting was co-chaired by officials from the UK and EU. And Dr. Andrew McCormick, Director General for International Relations, represented the Northern Ireland Executive in the UK delegation. And the Irish government was also represented by officials as part of the EU delegation. Um, so the committee was formally established, the specialised committee was formally established at the joint committee meeting uh, that we attended on the 30th of March. Uh, and the purpose of this first meeting was mainly to start preparatory work between the UK and the EU on a number of issues, including a, a stock take of um, implementation of the protocol and preparatory work on the four issues that we have identified in the protocol that require discussion and agreement um, at the Joint Committee, and then also formally um, establishing the Joint Consultative Working Group, which is that next, next level down from the Specialised Committee. And, and what we understand in the aftermath of that uh, meeting is that the European Commission uh, made it clear, and that was reflected, it was codified in a technical notice that was uh, issued on the same day, the 30th of, of April, mm -hmm. that they expect a comprehensive plan from the British Government on the approach to the implementation of the protocol, uh, which sets out a summary of, uh, and, and the technical note itself set out a summary of what the EU expects in terms of fulfilment uh, from the British Government to ensure that the uh, protocol is completely implemented. Uh, the committee agreed that the Joint Consultative Working Group, which will consider the more technical and detailed policies on implementation under the protocol, uh, will continue under the remit of the Specialised Committee, which should be convened soon. It has not, uh, and we understand that a date has yet to be agreed to do that. So I hope that's helpful, Chair, by way of an intro. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. We will uh, move quickly to questions to try and sure. stick to the three o'clock um, finish uh, for yourselves. Um, just first of all, in a technical thing, the paper that we received refers to the uh, joint committee meeting that took place on the 30th of April. I'm thinking it took place on the 30th of March, just in case there's been another one no. that we're not aware of. That's yeah, no, the, um, the Joint Committee took place on the 30th of March. The yes. Specialised Committee took part on the, took 30th took place of April. It's just April. in the paper, it's this Joint Committee that took place on the 30th of April, but I thought it was a no, typo, but just wanted to, yeah. to, to, to check that. Okay. Um, first question, the Joint Committee that you've attended, 
receives reports, as you've said, from the specialised committee, and that information will then be provided by the joint consultative working groups. That's what you've detailed to us here today. Now, none of these meetings are required to publish their agendas or their minutes. Um, the most that we will get is just a readout uh, of what's happening. So, given the sort of secretive nature of the meetings and the limited reporting that's provided afterwards, does the executive office have secret meetings to plan for your attendance at these? And in that, I mean, you know, we we don't really have scrutiny of what's happening at each of these levels, and we don't have scrutiny uh, in a greater sense to the executive uh, and the meeting because the subcommittee has been subsumed back into the main uh, executive itself. So how do we scrutinise in, in an open and transparent way what's happening? Yeah. Perhaps I could take that, Gordon, to begin. Uh, in relation to our attendance at the, uh, the, the joint committee, uh, it, it was uh, established in advance, Colin, uh, what the nature of the agenda would be. So it, it, was, it was quite limited in its scope, and it basically uh, authorised the establishment of the, uh, the specialised working groups. So to that extent, uh, it was a meeting when we went in, uh, clearly cited on the agenda, and uh, the outcome was an effectively predetermined. Uh, in relation to the uh, specialised committee then, which took place on the 30th of April, again, uh, that was the inauguration of, of that particular committee. Uh, it, 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 yes. Well, I think somebody was saying that telling somebody else that they were on their committee called there. Keep going. So it set in motion the process of business that will be undertaken by all of those specialised committees. And to that extent, then, uh, there was no pre-preparation uh, required for that, Colin. But in terms of your concern in relation to transparency, which I do think is, is core, uh, insofar as we are fettered by uh, matters which are being uh, negotiated between the British government and the EU uh, and are not in a position to, to brief the committee on, that will not exceed or infringe upon the uh, executive committee and the executive itself, ensuring that this committee is fully briefed and informed on all matters going forward. Uh, the matters of uh, Brexit uh, are uh, where the subject of a, a dedicated subcommittee. You, you would have been briefed in relation to the, uh, the reconfiguration of that arrangement within the executive itself. Uh, all parties are represented on the on the executive. Therefore, there was there was no uh, concern as to all parties not being involved in those discussions. And uh, confidentiality issues aside, pertaining to what is being discussed in confidence between the British government and the EU, then the executive is fully committed to ensuring that this committee is kept briefed and across the detail. This is a critical period that we're moving through. It's essential that uh, the Assembly is in a position to apply maximum democratic scrutiny, uh, that we develop as much consensus as possible on all of the relevant issues and challenges that we have going forward. And that's the commitment that we would give to you today, hopefully by way of reassurance uh, to your concern that in some way there will be decisions made meetings taking place and decisions being made which will determine an executive approach to uh, Brexit and the withdrawal agreement that this committee or the Assembly is not cited upon. Yeah, just, just to reiterate that, obviously um, there is a need for confidentiality. These is, are very difficult um, conversations that have the potential to be to be taking place, and we want to be able to go into that and, and respect the confidentiality. At the same time, we want to be very open and transparent um, where we can. Uh, you've asked us to come along to this committee. We have appeared, and we're more than happy to do that. We're more than happy to be held account and to be uh, assisted and advised, as is your role uh, as well in relation to these matters. And we don't shy away from that uh, at all. Um, the Brexit um, committee as well within the executive that's, that's looking at this, um, we're willing to um, share information where, where it's appropriate uh, and we don't shy away from that in any way. Well, I think maybe what, what we will do maybe afterwards amongst members is have a conversation on how we would envisage that and then maybe write to you um, the detail up because you know we, we 
you have come today and we're grateful for that, but we have to ask you. Um, in so asking, we then found out that um, the subcommittee had been scrapped and moved back into the committee. That wasn't something that was communicated from the department to ourselves. So, you know, we want to have the communication, but we want it to be a two-way street, that when you feel that you've got information that you'd like to update us on, that you actually provide that to us, that it's not us constantly having to ask you to come up to give us the information. So, but we'll maybe discuss afterwards how we as a committee would like to get some of that information and then we can um, raise it with you. But um, the specialised committee, ag again, it, it's allowed to consider proposals, as we understand, from the Equality and Human Rights Commissions and other north-south bodies. Now, unless implementation of those proposals requires legislation, because you're not, we're not seeing minutes of agendas and we're not seeing proposals that are being made, um, is it the case that various groups external to the Assembly can be making recommendations to the Specialist Committee, which could be adopted by the Joint Committee, and unless there's an actual legislative impact to it, we would never know that those decisions and discussions have been taking place? You're referencing the Human Rights Commission and the Equality Commission as, as two instances? And then the North-South Body. There, there are various, various yeah. people out there, that, other than the Assembly, there are various other people that can contribute to the agenda and the discussions there. So, so to clarify on that, the, the expectation is that the two commissions, for example, would have the latitude to, uh, to put into the public domain any recommendations or positions that they felt were relevant to the withdrawal agreement. Similarly, in relation to North-South bodies, they, they will report directly to the North-South Ministerial Council, and thereon, the North-South Ministerial Council would uh, be keeping the, uh, the, the executive, the assembly, uh, and in turn, the Erectus informed of any representations that were made by North-South bodies to uh, the specialised committee. Okay. I slightly disagree with your characterisation as well of it, of it being secret. There were readouts that were produced, um, statements that were issued by both the European Commission and the UK government um, on this. It's not the case um, that these are taking place in secret. Um, you know that they have happened. You know that we have attended. We have said that we're coming along to explain the points that we have made and how we've inputted into those um, committees as well. And then there has been a been a readout of these meetings. So I think it's perhaps a little bit too far to, to say that they are to they are to say that they are secret. Uh, and of course, as, as Declan has said, these these organisations will have the latitude to be able to to say what they have or haven't um, been been saying within the committee. For example, Colin, the the EU published its own technical note in the aftermath of the the last specialised committee. So that's in the public domain. Uh, the, the 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 British government did not do so. But I think that reflects the latitude that would uh, be shared by those who would go in and make representations to then in turn indicate what their aspiration or their intention was arising from uh, attendance at the meeting. I suppose the, the concern is if it's not an official record, then you don't have to include everything that was discussed, and therefore that would be where the issue uh, uh, would be. Yeah. <laughs> Is there another person joined us or left us there on the telephone? Still here, still here. Come on. Pat and Emma. George is still here. Yeah, I'm still here, Kate. Pat, I think maybe we've lost Pat there, have we? Sorry, we're just keeping a record for the for the minutes as well as the people coming. Finally, um, from my perspective, it was announced today by the UK Chancellor um, that we are facing a significant recession and uh, as a result of coronavirus and I suppose given the impact that we're going to experience economically across the world is this the right time for Brexit and do you see any reason why it would be wrong to ask for an extension to avoid the potential additional cat catastrophic economic um, hardship that businesses might suffer as a result of a no deal Brexit. So it's, I'm not saying about the politics of, I think we're all well rehearsed as to where the politics are here, but just that adding a no deal 
onto the table, is that not grounds for asking for an extension? Well, look, um, I think it's hard not to get into the, the politics of all of this. I think we have to um, deal with the, the reality that we find ourselves in at the minute, which is the UK has taken the decision to, to leave the European Union. I'm well aware that there are other views around this room uh, on that, and, and, and I respect that different people have, have different opinions. However, that's not ultimately going to be a decision for the Executive Office. Um, this is ultimately going to be... Um, the UK has, has taken the decision to leave the, the EU, and any decision on, on extension is not one for, uh, for us to make, um, but rather it's one um, that's an issue between the, the UK and the, and the EU at this time. As, as I indicated in earlier remarks, uh, and, and to just chime with Gordon's point, we will all have uh, political views on that matter, individual political views. So if, if I can step outside my responsibility as a minister, I, I think we're onto uncharted territory. Uh, we're talking about a recession, a global recession, uh, that uh, some have speculated has not existed in over 100 years. It's an unprecedented level of economic and social catastrophe across the globe, both in the northern and the uh, uh, southern hemispheres. So I think it would be uh, essential that those realities, those geopolitical realities, are very strongly taken on board. But clearly the decision of whether to proceed to deal with that issue of transition, Colin, that is a decision which needs to be addressed. If it is to be considered, taken forward, it needs to be uh, addressed within the next few weeks uh, and, uh, and by the end of June. But do you feel that not taking a position on that indicates that you're happy to, con with the, to not have an extension? No, I, th I, think I think you have to ask for an extension think, and then that articulates... I think the corollary of all of this is, and the executive is, is very focused on the scale of the health, social and economic emergencies combined that we face, uh, I think it's critical that the executive is uh, making an assessment of all of these crucial challenges. Uh, so I think that probably is a discussion that the executive needs to have. It has not. Therefore, there is not a unified executive view on the issue of transition. But I think it's very difficult not to contemplate the need, the essential need for that discussion to take place, given the level of challenge that we now face here in Ireland, on these islands and across the, uh, across the globe. If, if I could just push that point, if you don't ask for an extension, I think it's perfectly reasonable for London to take the perspective that you don't want one, and therefore it, having different political views means that you need to come to a political view, but you need to articulate either you do want an extension or you don't, but if you don't offer an opinion, it will automatically be assumed that we're happy to proceed without an extension, and I, I don't think that's if you, don't put, your, if you don't put your running shoes on, you're not in the race. So, I mean, I think there's good logic in what you're saying. I, I, don't, I don't think it's conceivable for us not to have that kind of discussion at the executive, given the scale of the challenge that we face at this point in time. Whatever is decided on the other side of that by the executive is a different matter entirely. But uh, this, is a, this, this is a scale of economic challenge, the like of which we have never seen before. And... Uh, and, and, and COVID-19 has changed everything for us. So our perspective on Brexit and the withdrawal agreement and transitional uh, arrangements uh, six months ago, 12 months ago, I think has been fundamentally shifted and changed. The context has been fundamentally shifted and changed, arising from the last period of months as we move through this pandemic. I'll open out to the, the committee now. Trevor, you're looking... Uh, I'm happy to go with Deputy okay. Chair. Oh, sorry, my apologies. That's my, 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 I'm a mister. I should go to my Deputy Chair first. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm new. I was so looking for really, Mike. <laughs> go on ahead, Doug. Sorry. No, no, don't, don't worry. Listen, Declan Gordon, th thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's really, really, that was really, really useful, actually. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's a complex issue, and I know you're dealing with a complex issue, and we need to be prepared for, for, for changes. So, so thank you for that. But I did get a real sense... Um, from what you've told us, it was that first meeting was a real small map, big hands type stuff, you know, very broad brush on, on setting up of, of that committee and, and the specialist committee. Um, and I guess the, the question would be, are you concerned that, that halfway through the year, 
nearly, um, that, that we aren't moving quick enough in regards to this. And, and those key milestones, I know you mentioned it, Declan, those key milestones um, do have to be, to be met and those decisions do have to be made um, in regards to um, the, the extension. Uh, and not taking away the fact is that the executive uh, and the confidentiality piece, and, and I know it's not secrecy, but the confidentiality piece, but, but we need as much buy-in as we possibly can in regards to this from all of the political parties. And how do we try and get that buy-in to the executive so that they give you the, those briefing notes that, that hit these, these key milestones? Well, I think, obviously, first and foremost, what we want to, to see happen is to make sure that we get an outcome from the implementation of the withdrawal agreement that leaves us with as little friction as possible um, as, we, as we seek to trade. So that's first and foremost what we want. After that, we would like that to happen as soon as possible um, so that businesses have time to prepare um, as we move towards the, the end of the, the transition period. Those two can sometimes be in conflict um, as we're trying to get the, the best outcome but getting it um, as, as soon as possible can, can, can also cause difficulties. Um, and what we also um, need to, uh, I suppose, be aware of is the future relationship, the, the possibility of the free trade agreement between the U UK uh, and the rest of the EU. EU will also have uh, implications for what the protocol is going to look like and how it's going to have to be implemented as well. So those things are all, all going around. I accept your point, time is moving on. Um, in, in terms of, of timeline, the specialised committee will obviously be meeting again soon to consider those four issues, and then they have the opportunity to make re um, recommendations um, in, in mid-June to the joint committee uh, altogether. So we look, um, in a large part, this is out of our hands. Um, we're not in charge of the um, of the timing um, of, of all of this. Uh, in addition, then, you have the, the other negotiations that are taking place. So um, we certainly are... Um, I don't know, we've talked about some disagreements that might exist within the um, parties within the executive, but we do have a very clear message on what we want to see um, on the um, unfettered access, on the frictionless trade, all the rest of it. We're very clear of where it is that we, we want to get to, and the, the executive's united in that. Uh, and, uh, thanks, Gordon. And, and, and I mean, that's, that's, that's very clear, but it's, to, it's to really to reiterate what the, the, the chair has said is that there's a real concern about that scrutiny piece because, yes, we're getting the inform information, but we're getting it after the fact, whereas it's having that scrutiny before the information is fed in, if you know what I mean. I mean, of course there'll be disagreements. There'll be disagreements about asking for an extension. Uh, there'll be disagreements about the Belfast office. There, there, there are disagreements. There are executive disagreements. But, it, but it's how do you get that scrutiny piece into this before it goes to the committees? so that it's scrutinised, looked at, and issues identified and, and problems fixed beforehand. Even, even at the stages, is there a place where the, the party leaders group, when they meet, have an opportunity to discuss some of those very live issues before the, the meeting so that they can feed into it? Is, is that a possibility? Because I think that's the real concern we have here is, is scrutiny. Uh, the, exec the executive uh, agreed with the reconfiguration of the arrangement from the Brexit subcommittee that it was important that uh, in, in a very discreet and carefully moderated way that uh, parties would be involved in the, the process of, uh, of being briefed and uh, having foresight on in order that the representatives uh, of parties on the uh, power sharing executive on the, in, in the government could in fact uh, give a broader view uh, in terms of the concerns that would be shared within uh, their parties in terms of the issues going forward, the information that was required in order to inform decisions, with a view then to trying to maximise the level of consensus that could be shared. Without, yeah. without at the same time breaching the confidentiality of the executive on separate executive matters, and and that's the that's the the, the, the dichotomy just trying to keep 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 both. Can I just ask a, a question? Um, please don't take this as a as a as a personal or or or, or, or anything like that. But your part within the committee, uh, are you absolutely clear. You have got a speaking role. They're not forcing you into a corner, and you have good guidance notes that come from the executive, which you will you have the opportunity. To, to ensure that they get pushed into that committee, is that is that fair? Oh, yeah, it's not the case that we're just observers um, yeah. on this committee. In fact, we're invited, um, first of all, to attend the meeting, and then we are invited to, to speak. 
and we both get the opportunity to do that to, to feed into every issue that's being discussed. We've only had one meeting so far, so I hope that that's I hope that that continues. Um, but I know certainly um, I don't feel either that this is just about um, about lip service towards us. I, I, I do feel that there's the desire there for genuine engagement. Thank you. Thank you. And, and there are shared. Uh, executive negotiation priorities and we've, we've reflected on a, on a number of those. So our function uh, going in is to, in a very robust way, uh, represent those interests and that's why we, we deliberately drew from our speaking notes shared on the, the 30th of March in our opening uh, testimony to the committee to give you a sense that those shared negotiation priorities were very clearly tabled, uh, articulated. There was some uh, discussion in what was a reasonably limited meeting. You're right. Uh, in some respects, it was uh, it was light touch, but it was about authorising then the need for these committees to be uh, established so that the train could start moving in relation to dealing with the modalities and the issues that would arise in terms of how we uh, ensure that the protocol is is fully implemented. We could uh, and and should expect, I think, much greater communication from the, uh, the British government approach in relation to uh, the, the engagements that are underway. And I, I think that it's, it's fair comment and it's not a breach of confidentiality to say that while there is communication and the, uh, the two joint first ministers have been engaged in a series of conversations with uh, Michael Gove, with uh, uh, Penny Mordaunt and other officials and our own officials are very closely engaged with uh, British officials and we have at the same time close contact with our colleagues in Scotland and Wales and those administrations and also in Dublin. Uh, truth be told, at this stage of, the, uh, of, of, of where we are at, it would be much better that both our officials and our government were cited on the type of planning assumptions, for example, that the British government is bringing into these negotiations and how, in fact, they do intend to deal with a number of the issues that the European Commission has set a very high level of expectation must be met. As with everything, communication yeah. is key. Uh, thanks, Tecla. I mean, really useful, um, uh, because I think what you're saying there is, is you're not necessarily getting sight of some of the, the higher level planning assumptions from the UK government. Is that um, correct? No, thank you. Thank you. And, on, thank and, and I would add to that, uh, Doug, we, we've made that very explicit. We've said that, myself and Gordon, uh, earlier this year uh, in, uh, in, uh, in London, made that very point that it is imperative that we are cited on all of those issues, uh, that there are no surprises, and that is certainly a view which is shared by both uh, the Welsh and the Scottish governments also. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Trevor? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, the, the question of unfettered access, I'm sorry to go back to it again, east, west and north, south, um, there's always been a contradiction, hasn't there, between the uh, EU position, particularly in terms of trade between Northern Ireland and QB, and the British government's position. And I see just today, actually, that the Road Haulage Association has come out very, very forcefully and said, look, this time scale is now impossible for us. And they, they have probably a bigger vested interest in this than a lot of businesses do because they have to transport the stuff, do all the paperwork. So you have to go back to it. You know, the, the, the time scale for the, uh, the conclusion of this whole negotiation was set before we realised there was going to be a pandemic. And I fancy if you were setting it now, you wouldn't set it in terms of six months cut-off point to make a decision and 12 months to, to implement that decision. So is, is there, as is, is the British government, in your experience and what you're getting from these talks, still wedded absolutely to the notion that we conclude the negotiations one way or another on the 31st of December? And even that we may pull the plug at the end of June, if it doesn't look <coughs> likely that we're going to make progress. There has been no indication in the British government's intention of, of a British government intention to uh, to seek a transition. I think, in fact, they've indicated that they uh, they're wedded to the uh, the withdrawal date, yeah. Trevor. Notwithstanding all all of the challenges which you have summarised. But the, the, sorry, Gordon. Maybe you wanted to. No, no, you're okay. Go ahead. The the, the, the the British government 
their, their, their position is really, frankly, untenable. I mean, they may be able to conclude something, but if they do, it's going to be completely unsatisfactory. And I go back to the road hauliers. What, what are they supposed to do? They're, they're not yet in a position to know what, what type of formalities they're going to have to go through to move stuff around, east, west, north, south, across the channel. It's not just the Northern Ireland RHI, it's, it's the national RHI. And uh, I, I just really don't know where we're going with this. And it seems to be an awful lot of committees which seem to meet fairly irregular times. But where's, where's the action here? We're six or seven weeks away from the 30th of June. Are you satisfied generally with the progress here and with your ability to input into decisions that are going to be made on a UK-wide basis? So um, the, the government have said that they will, as part of a new decade new approach, that there will be unfet, unfettered access, this was repeated again today by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, for goods that are travelling from Northern Ireland to the rest of um, the UK. Um, in terms of goods travelling from UK to, to Northern Ireland, that's the work that's going to take place within the joint committee that has been set up. They're going to look at that. The specialised committee are going to uh, meet again in a couple of weeks um, to look at the progress that has been made and to put potential recommendations back then to the, to the joint committee. Um, so it's over the next period of weeks that we will see what progress has been made um, and what potential road path um, our roadmap there is for us to, to move forward. Um, so that's when we'll probably get, get more sight of things within, within the next few weeks. Yep. But I could perhaps add to that helpfully, uh, Trevor. Uh, I think Gordon mentioned that we've only had the two rounds of uh, negotiations and that's as a consequence of COVID-19. So the, the periods were the 2nd to the 5th of March and then the 20th to the 24th of April. And what we do know is that the, uh, the British government and the EU have exchanged legal texts on a free trade agreement uh, and a number of other areas. Now, the EU text was published, but the British government texts have not been made public and they have not been shared with us. They've not been shared with us or the Scottish or the Welsh administrations. There are suggestions that uh, there is a convergence on core areas of a free trade agreement. Sorry, I'll, I'll come back. George, can you just be, be careful if you're talking there? Maybe you could put your phone on mute just in case because it comes out through the speakers here. Right, that's OK. Good man, Sorry thank you. That. Thank you very much, thank you. Very right, So the, the indications are that uh, there has been convergence on a number of core areas relating to a free trade agreement on goods and services. Uh, energy and transport, but there has been no convergence between the EU and the British government in matters relating to governance. Uh, so building on the negotiation principles that we summarised earlier, uh, that the executive has adopted, we will need to consider our priorities uh, for the negotiations to ensure that our position is fully represented in that context as far as possible in the positions that the British government are taking forward in the withdrawal negotiations. Now, that was discussed uh, by the executive on Monday, asked, and these issues are being brought back into the executive again on, uh, on this forthcoming Monday. The next round of negotiations is, is taking place contemporaneously. Uh, another is, as I indicated, due at the beginning of June, 1st of June. And that's before what they've described as their high-level meeting takes place uh, later in June, which is about taking stock of the progress at that stage, Trevor. But hopefully that is helpful by way of indicating convergence, divergence, uh, a, 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 a decision by the British government not to publish text, uh, unlike the EU to date, and then all of that having to be assessed in the round come the high-level meeting later in June, which is the stock take. OK, well, I'll, I'll not pursue it. I'll, I'll wait ex with the expectation <laughs> for what happens before the end of June here. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Martina? Um, thank you, Declan. Thank you, Gordon, for, for your presentation. And I, I, I think we have received uh, a lot of information from the officials, and there, there's technical notes out there. So um, as an MLA on this committee, I feel very much well informed. 
Um, the one thing I would like to pick up on is the comments that have been made around the full of adherence to, to the protocol. And the, on the 30th of April, the Commission asking for a comprehensive plan. So what preparation um, is currently underway, um, or indeed has been completed, uh, to ensure the full implementation of the protocol in Ireland in terms of the withdrawal agreement? And I think that's the information that businesses and others need to hear about the preparation work that has been done or is actually completed. When I finished off and responding to Trevor there, I said that the executive had been given a, a briefing by TEO officials on Monday on the latest stage of negotiations between the British government and the EU. I suppose the sum total of that, and this is without breaching executive confidentiality, is that after those exchanges between the European Commission and the British government over recent weeks, the British government has confirmed that it will urgently put in place detailed plans with the executive, which does include the physical posts at ports of entry. So they, they, they have signalled that in order to implement the protocol for the 1st of January next year in a way that we all want, which is, of course, to avoid uh, disruption to trade, that doesn't slow our business, uh, businesses down, that doesn't put the cost of doing business onto the consumers uh, and, as a result, carrying that burden, that delivery on that infrastructure needs to start as soon as possible. And the, the British government has indicated that uh, it will provide advice on the requirements and the funding to, to put that in place. I would refer you to the technical note that was published on the 30th of April by the, the European Commission, uh, because it sets out in detail the requirements from the EU, uh, the EU's expectations that the British government would in fact provide very detailed uh, timelines and implementation measures to fulfil their responsibilities and as a, as, as a matter of urgency. And, and to repeat a, 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 an earlier point, uh, all of these, it goes back to Doug's, uh, your own question, Colin, about where we are at in the, in the face of this perfect storm, these are all uh, critical issues that the executive now needs to consider um, in the immediate term, because it is clear that time's closing in. We're looking at a clock which is ticking at seven months to go uh, to implement the protocol and to secure that future relationship between uh, the, the British government and the, and the UK uh, and the EU. And our objective as an executive as a United Executive, has to be to protect jobs, trade and the economy and also the Good Friday Agreement, ensure that there is no hard border between North and South and that there is free movement of trade North, South and East, West. Uh, and and, and the, the committee in, in following those events would also be aware that the, the British Government will hold that uh, stock take conference at the end of June. So I think, in, in having mentioned that earlier, that is a point where we all need to begin to focus our attention in terms of the British government following through in relation to those, uh, the expectation on behalf of the EU that those detailed measures and timeframes will in fact be implemented to the satisfaction of the European Commission as set out in the technical note. I think that's important information uh, to hear today because, am I understanding correctly, um, that the physical posts that you're talking about at the ports, are we talking Larne, Belfast and Warren Point? And you said there was financial requirements going towards that, that for the operators of the posts of, of those ports to uh, to get them ready so that the border in the Irish Sea, uh, so that they, obviously we're talking about unfettered access in, as Gordon says from here, um, into Britain. But I think the last comment I read on the 27th of April um, from the Minister Gove, who talked about the smoothest possible access uh, for, from, for British goods into here. So are we talking about the funding requirements for those posts and those physical posts, uh, the preparation for those posts in time with the timeline that we're facing the seven months into extension from now to then? The European Commission has an expectation that what they call 
official controls regulations will be met. So that means that there must be the required standard of infrastructure established at all of those points and ports of entry uh, to ensure that their expectations are, are, are completely fulfilled. So, for example, we do not have the infrastructure that would allow for the passage of livestock mm -hmm. uh, at this point in time. So it's about ensuring that the necessary checks are uh, operated uh, according to the standards set down in the protocol by the European Commission and that the necessary infrastructure is in place to allow that to be fully enabled. And they're going to pay for that, the financial, the financial requirements that you mentioned. Is the British government going to assist with the payment for those, that infrastructure to be built? The indications are that, yes, they will be prepared to do that. I think just the, the question you ask is uh, around implementation, um, and it's important to note that um, that's what the Joint Committee is there for. It's not as if there already is a, a roadmap as to how this is going to be implemented. That's the, the role of the Joint Committee to decide um, how it can be implemented. That's going to have to be a decision taken together between the UK uh, and the EU. It will also be dependent, of course, on what the future trade uh, agreement looks like uh, as well. Um, so we have to look into all of those um, issues. It's not as if we already have um, something ready to ready to go. Um, it will depend on the outcome of the free trade agreement as well. And I think that's that's important to, to note, as well as further conversations that will take part as, as part of the joint consultative working group, the specialised committee and the joint committee. The joint committee will determine whether there will be posts. It will determine what will actually come in, if it's going to be compliant with EU rules um, or not. My understanding from the technical note and information at the weekend that there are 700 FETs um, have been recruited um, in Britain and some of them are here and so at those ports uh, uh, of entry there needs to be physical infrastructure for FETs and for custom officers. And again, that will depend on um, the outworking of the, the work of the Joint Committee, looking at those um, uh, products that would be designated uh, at, at risk of, go of, of going into the EU. They will determine what's at risk and what's not at risk, not whether they jo will joint or not. Yeah. But there is a lead-in period for all of that to be delivered upon. That again is part of the expectation that the European Commission has. So as, as we spoke about the clock ticking towards the withdrawal date, and uh, in terms of the next seven months, and the clock ticking from this point towards the stock take meeting in June, equally in terms of the expectation that the European Commission has as per the protocol, uh, they're, they're, they are operating to a timeline by which stage they expect the necessary requirements and infrastructure to be put in place uh, to ensure that all of the necessary customs checks, uh, livestock checks, health checks, etc., etc., can be carried out. Before the seven months is complete, before we get to that deadline of seven months? before we get to the end of this year and the, the 1st of January? As I understand that they, they, they have a timeline that they need to see met yeah, in, order, yeah. in order for uh, all of the different stages that would take you to that point of preparation yeah. are in fact fulfilled. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Christopher. They may have a deadline. We're no longer an EU member state and therefore no longer obligated to live under their rules and their conditions. And I think it's important to make that observation they are no longer facing a Prime Minister without a majority and a Parliament that is hamstrung and unable to make any decisions. So I think it is important in terms of the context. We are no longer in a situation similar to that which Theresa May was in. We actually have a government that is capable of governing and capable of going ahead without uh, the consent of the European Commission. Can I ask what proposals are in place uh, to ensure the protection of east-west and west aid trade in terms of minimising the logistical challenges? associated with the operation of this protocol? Um, well, those are obviously going to be issues for the uh, Joint Committee to, to look at. Um, but of course, if you are to um, read the, um, uh, the protocol itself, um, it, it, it does state in the, in the preamble that nothing in the protocol prevents the United Kingdom for, uh, from ensuring unfettered market access for goods moving from, from Northern Ireland um, to the rest of the UK's uh, internal market and, and obviously then goes on to, to, to talk about Northern Ireland remaining part um, of, the, of the UK customs territory as well. So the job that we have 
now is to make sure that as we work in the joint committee and that the protocol is implemented. And this, this is the shared uh, view of every single party in the committee, uh, is that the protocol needs to be implemented in such a way uh, that doesn't cause that, fr that friction um, east-west or, or west-east. And obviously, just it's a statement of fact that the east-west trade is significantly more important than the north-south trade, is it, is it not? Well, absolutely. Nobody would deny that. Um, it is absolutely still the case that the rest of the UK is our, is our biggest trading partner. And uh, an awful lot of uh, focus was obviously kept on wanting to maintain the, um, the north-south um, uh, uh, keeping the, the, the border um, uh, between the, the, the north and the south open so there could be continued um, uh, trade and, 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 and um, uh, we, we all wanted to see that. Uh, however, in terms of the sheer number, in terms of the number of jobs, in terms of the number of goods that pass between, it is by far our most uh, important market and that's, that's realised by all parties in the executive when we say we don't want to see that friction take place. because. Um, People's jobs depend on this. People's livelihoods uh, depend on this, and and our prosperity depends on this. We're facing uh, enough challenges right now as a result of, of COVID. Um, the, the last thing that we need is additional barriers um, put up between ourselves and our largest trading partner. So we need to be united in this, doing everything that we can uh, in our power um, to get the right outcome and to to ensure our, our future economic prosperity. What link is there between the joint committee's work and the substantive? UK EU trade agreement negotiations. So I think it is important that we that we look at these in in, in two separate um, silos, if you like. They are um, going to affect each other, but but they are separate. Um, the joint committee doesn't have any um, responsibility in terms of um, the negotiations on the future relationship. Those are ongoing and those are separate. Um, the role of the joint committee uh, is in terms of the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Okay, and just to be clear, in terms of our feeding into the development of a future trade agreement, how does that work? Uh, well, there's continued and ongoing um, collaboration, uh, not just with um, uh, the UK government, um, but with other devolved administrations as well. Um, regular calls take place, as, as um, Minister Kearney has already said, um, between both First Minister and Deputy First Minister and the, the Paymaster General and First and Deputy First Minister and the, the, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. So those, continue, those discussions are ongoing uh, and we have that ability to, to feed in uh, to that as well as through the, um, the JMC, the, the, the ministerial meetings that take place uh, at a devolved level uh, as well. Perhaps it is. Excellent. <laughs> Stalford and surround sound. Very good. Um, As if we're not suffering enough. Uh, like yes, that's moment. right. Um, so we do have that opportunity to, to continue to, to feed in um, yeah. to, to HMG. I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that the European Commission published their position, their opening position, because it was so unreasonable. Um, one of the sticking points has been access to fisheries. Fisheries, obviously, an important uh, enterprise here in Northern Ireland. Um, what's our view on continued access to EU fishermen to Northern Ireland waters? Well, um, obviously... Because um, you'll recall a uh, Northern Ireland fisher boat was apprehended by our nearest neighbours and taken to port yes, not well, so long ago. Obviously, we believe um, that we should be able to, to fish in our, own, uh, in our own waters and we should, we should get the benefits uh, of that. I think it's fair to say, I don't think anyone would disagree with the fact that our fishermen have suffered uh, a great deal over the uh, last number of, of years. And I certainly don't want to make um, uh, their lives or their livelihoods any, any more difficult. Thank you. So thank you very much. That's uh, everybody in the room, but we do have still a few members um, on the telephone system, including Christopher, apparently, as well, but of course they will not take additional questions from him there. Um, Pat, or Emma, you were on first. Emma, do you have any questions you wish to ask? I don't know. Okay, Grant. Um, then we had Pat next. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, Chair. Uh, thanks. I just, just, just want to make a point about the uh, connection today. The reason uh, Christopher heard himself talking on the phone line was because I'm actually watching the live stream or trying <laughs> to because the, uh, the the phone line is so bad and I had just unmuted in anticipation of you coming to us. So uh, that's that's the reason for that. But 
but it's very difficult to follow uh, yeah. on the phone itself. There, there needs to be some improvement if we're mm -hmm. going to continue with this system. I, I would just, just to concur with what Pat's saying, I'm finding that it's just cutting out for half a minute at a time and then back in again. Um, I can barely, but I've found in the past weeks as well, I can hear clearly anyone that's dialed in, but I can't hear you guys in the room. Um, it, it, it's difficult to follow it now. Pat, I, I, I wish it was as simple in life that there was a little button that we could do, use to minimise Christopher, but that's not allowed. So, But in your computer screen, yeah, I understand the difficulties that there are because there is a delay uh, in watching the live stream. Um, and that we did get a presentation this week about an, uh, another uh, system to be able to use for, for committee meetings, and that will hopefully be online in the next uh, fortnight, and that will just eradicate all of these problems. So sorry that there's been a dropout in that. Um, George, I know you're still there. But do you have any questions? Please, Terry. Yep. Yep, button. No. Is that myself, uh, Terry? Yes, yes, George. Do you have any George, questions? Hi, George. I, I'm, I'm the same. My sound's just up and down, up and down. You can hardly hear a thing, but I have one question here. Okay. Uh, for the, 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 the both ministers, or whichever one of us wants the answer for them. Uh, thank them for coming to the committee today. Um, how many civil servants have been redeployed from work and EU-related issues to deal with the COVID-19 situation that we're now in? So, well, th thanks for the question, George. Can you hear me? It's Declan here. You're, you're just up and down, up and down all the time. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to listen here. Yeah. OK, we, we don't have an exact figure for you, George, uh, but it could be as many as 10 who have been right. redeployed uh, to work on COVID-19 related matters. But that is not exceptional to this section of the no, civil service. Right. You, 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 you'll find that there is a fact. You'll find, you'll, find, you'll find that there's a quota or a factor of personnel uh, which crosses every department. Which, who have been redeployed into uh, the priority, the overall priority of, yeah, of uh, fighting, fighting back against COVID-19. Yeah, yeah. Is, is there any plans to, to amend that so that you would be back to quota again? Uh, absolutely. We need to maintain the resilience of, of the civil service. But as you'll also appreciate, uh, we, we made a decision uh, some uh, months ago that the scale of the pandemic we face would require an all-of-government approach. Of course, of course. And as a result, we have, yeah, we have, we have remodeled, re remodeled exactly. structures and redeployed personnel to meet that demand. Thanks very much for your answer. Thank you, Unite. I know that we had pre-discussions, Ministers, about um, some of the questions that we might ask. And maybe just to add to, to what George has said there, um, there's a sense of how many civil servants have made, been moved from EU duties in terms of Brexit duties into COVID, uh, given that I suppose everybody was taken, maybe not aback, but we were so focused on COVID and then all of a sudden, in about three, four weeks in, that it was suddenly thrown out, Brexit's happening, whether you like it or not, COVID or not. And suddenly we had a lot of civil servants that may have been involved in Brexit preparations that were moved. So rather than the, you know, the whole civil service Reorganising, is there an effort to try and move those EU Brexit focused people back into role at this stage? I, I inquired earlier, uh, just to inform myself, if we had a figure yep. of, of how many personnel may well have been moved away from EU specific Brexit related duties to COVID 19. It was confirmed for me that a number have. Mm. Uh, some of them are quite senior civil servants. Uh, it could be as many as 10, Colin. It might be slightly more. Uh, but it, it is reflective of an overall demand, and what I would say is that some of the personnel who have been uh, moved away from this particular responsibility have, have been given, have been redeployed because of their expertise and their experience in relation to what they can offer the overall executive fight back against COVID-19. So these are not decisions that would have been taken in an ad hoc way. Uh, they would have been fairly carefully calculated, but clearly. As you rightly said at the outset, we, we face an ongoing uh, national, international uh, pandemic and health emergency 
we also have uh, the, the challenge of uh, Brexit looming, coming at us like a juggernaut. Uh, we need to find the capacity within the civil service and government to ensure that we can meet the demands of each challenge. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll take this point back into the department uh, following the, uh, the hearing today. And uh, I think the bottom line is that we need to ensure that we have the uh, organisational resilience to not only meet COVID-19, but also to meet the complexity of the challenge presented by uh, withdrawal from the EU. Um, ministers, thank, thank you very much for, for your attendance here today. Um, you know, the executive has been up and running again now for four months. It feels like about four years just because of the amount of, of pressure that there is on everybody in the work that we're doing with the coronavirus. I know ministers and representatives are working around the clock today with lots of concern and queries. So um, I can't even remember if this is your first or second visit to this committee. If it's your first, I welcome you. If it's your second, thank you for coming back again. But we appreciate you joining us today and giving us as much information as you have. And hopefully we can set a schedule whereby we may be getting an update from you in, in a few weeks' time. But thank you very much. We're happy to do that, uh, Mr Chairman, on, on a regular basis. Uh, I know you said earlier on that um, we had to be asked to come. Um, I always thought that was the, was, was the case, but we're we're happy to make ourselves uh, available. There's no problem with That's that. That's good. That's very welcome. Thank you very much okay. indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And committee, with your approval, we'll take a leave just for two minutes, just to let the ministers leave. And we had asked the Quality Commission just to wait until a quarter past three. So we have just a couple of minutes of German to get them gathered. Just going. Can we have you just a few Yes, yeah. We could do that, actually, yeah. Let's just get some water as well. All the best, folks. Thank you. Thank you. If you're happy, then. Oh, no. No, no. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, then we could just summarise from that, that meeting then because the, these we'll hear them beeping in. They're, they're, they're just going to join in. Yeah, okay. Um, I just didn't want all those beeps occurring at three o'clock, which is when we had asked them to ring in, so we've emailed them and told them to wait till quarter past three. Um, we did circulate um, to people um, questions, quite a substantial list of questions, uh, some of which were covered today in some respects and some that weren't. Maybe with the committee's approval, we could forward those to the department and ask them if they could give us a written response to those questions, which might provide a bit more sort of breadth. But we did get a, a good bit of information there today, but... Would members be happy enough with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That would be very, very useful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Martina? Um, I mean, uh, uh, Christopher's not here, and uh, I'll be able to say this to him when he comes in, because uh, like, I just don't think it's helpful to be rehashing all that we went through as we, as we were working into the, uh, the Brexit withdrawal agreement, because the Withdrawal Agreement Act was signed off on and agreed by Boris Johnson. Uh, not by Theresa May. So we all need to be very clear of it is a legal obligation for the protocol. For me today, the most important piece of information that I heard, and I'm hoping that industry and the haulage sector and others hear it as well, is that preparation is actually underway for the kind of infrastructure that is required at ports. What the business sector needs to know, how will that impact then on how they do business? But for a long time, for too many months, we've heard that there were no preparation or little preparation being done in this way. We know that the British government has confirmed that it's sticking to that deadline and that the comprehensive plan that the Commission has asked for is being produced and that they have funding being allocated towards port operators to put the necessary infrastructure in place. So I think that's news that the business sector will hear. They will probably want that then unpacked as to what will be the implications of that infrastructure that's going to have huts for custom officers and yep. uh, FETs and so on, more than what is currently there. And people need to understand, the business sector needs to understand how that's going to impact on their business. I think they're talking 50,000 extra personnel. I mm -hmm. read somewhere today. Had been there Irish time. Would, 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 that like, would you like the, the core of that maybe to be a question that we add on, just to maybe give us well, some more I think more we got the answer. 
Uh, yeah, we, got an, we, got, we got the answer today we, that at least we know now, sitting here as MLAs who scrutinise this, we have been informed today that infrastructure has been put in place. Whatever everybody wants for you on that, infrastructure has been put in place at Belfast, Larne and Warren Point. I think what we would probably need as we're going towards the different committee meetings is that business will need to understand then how is this going to impact mm -hmm. on the goods that move between, given that there are two FAT systems going to be put in place, mm -hmm. one FAT system for goods and the other FAT system for services. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of information, I think, as we as a committee will need to be informing ourselves so that we can form, inform the different sectors as to how that is being implemented and we are scrutinising uh, the information that we have received. But I have found, at least today, I am leaving this committee more informed that infrastructure is being put in place, uh, that the Commission has asked for a comprehensive plan and that the British Government has said that we adhere to that. Okay. Right. Um, I haven't heard too many... Beats of joining us there. Well, maybe some, do we have anybody on from the Equality Commission? Yes, uh, Geraldine McGahey and Evelyn Collins are here. Oh, excellent, oh. excellent. Um, right. So, um, you think? members, if you're happy, then we can move to item five on the agenda, which is the briefing from the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. Um, on page 27 of the meeting pack, uh, there is the briefing paper that was provided to us. Um, and I can advise that we have with this, as mentioned, uh, Geraldine McGahey, the Chief Commissioner of the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland, and Evelyn Collins, who's the Chief Executive of the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. Um, maybe just to welcome both of you to our meeting today. Thank you for coming along to give us what um, is was initially billed as our introduction to various um, arm's length bodies. It was supposed to have taken place quite a number of weeks ago, but unfortunately the events of coronavirus have, have postponed matters, but we're trying to catch up on that. Um, we will uh, both be recording and the uh, conversations that we're having are also being broadcast live through the Assembly and that there is a Hansard record being kept of that. That's just to advise you, not to frighten you. Um, and what I can do is pass over to yourselves, uh, Geraldine and Evelyn, if you want to, to give us a short briefing and we'll follow it up with some questions after. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Chairman, and good afternoon, members. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. And I have to say it is unfortunate that we're doing this remotely instead of in person, particularly as it's my first meeting with you as Chief Commissioner. Um, I've had the great pleasure of being appointed as a Chief Commissioner with effect from the 1st of March, just before lockdown. So I really haven't got my feet under the table properly yet. Although I had been Commissioner with the Northern Ireland, uh, Quality Commission for Northern Ireland since 2015 and Deputy Chief since June of last year. So I very much look forward to ongoing engagement with the committee, uh, which has such an important oversight role on the work of the Executive Office. So until we can meet in person, I'm very happy to attend the committee remotely, joined as I am today by our Chief Executive, Evelyn Collins. I hope you find the briefing note that we sent through to you of some use. Um, we did that to give you some background information and maybe help you focus the discussion that you wanted to have with it. But hopefully you'll have seen from it that the Commission plays a vital role in working to secure greater equality of opportunity and in challenging discrimination. And basically our work falls across uh, four key areas, that is assisting individuals with advice and sometimes support with cases of discrimination, supporting employers and public authorities with guidance and information about requirements of equality law and good practice, encouraging the mainstreaming of equality considerations in public policy development and delivery through research to highlight not just key inequalities but to gain an understanding of public opinion and then to uh, investigate alleged breaches of equality schemes. So we do work at many different levels to help make progress towards a more equal society. And we will be very uh, glad to answer any questions that you have. But before you do that, could I maybe just use my opening remarks to highlight some key aspects of our work in response to COVID-19? And at the outset, I would wish to reassure you that the Commission will support the work of the Executive as it strives to keep people safe and the necessity for extraordinary measures 
But I would also say that we will use our powers and speak out where we believe it's necessary on equality issues. So what we've done, uh, we've adapted what we're doing and how we're doing it. All staff are working from home, but we are able to continue to carry on with all of our services. We have been providing support and advice to employers, service providers and public authorities. And we are continuing to receive and respond to inquiries from the public who are concerned about their rights. And we've also changed uh, the emphasis of our business plan for the next year in order to respond to the impacts of the pandemic. Through all of our communications that we've had to date, we've sought to raise awareness that equality matters in these difficult times, particularly as early evidence is suggesting that there's differential impacts of COVID-19. And we've highlighted the need to identify and consider equality issues in all of the responses to the pandemic, as well as the need to monitor emerging or potential equality issues. We have and will continue to highlight the importance of the existing framework of equality duties being taken into account in decision making and the particular care that needs to be taken in the development of criteria for healthcare decisions so that they comply with equality principles. So as time goes on, we'll be producing a number of rolling statements on COVID-19 and the quality implications with a focus on potential emerging or exacerbated inequalities. And we have written to the First and Deputy First Minister to reinforce the importance of equality legislation during the need to progress with age GFS legislation and to the Health Minister to set out our key concerns and to seek assurances in relation to health and social care provision for disabled people during the pandemic. Advice and guidance to employers, service providers continues to be updated and we've issued guidance notes in relation to furlough leave, protecting and pregnant employees, making reasonable adjustments for disabled people, and on the Section 75 duties when developing COVID-19 related policies. And we will update them as the situation evolves and lockdown starts to lift. We've also written to the Chief Executive of each of the Health Trusts to remind them of the continued requirement to ensure effective implementation of Section 75, equality and good relations duties at this important time. You might be interested to know that during the past six weeks, we have had significant inquiries from people regarding potential discriminatory treatment that they have received relating to COVID-19. And we will continue to monitor complaints of potential discrimination across each of the areas protected by discrimination legislation arising from the health emergency. So to conclude, we will continue to seek opportunities to highlight the importance of paying attention to equality considerations in the various responses that are being made to COVID-19 and seek to identify and highlight key areas of public policy or law reform with emerging potential equality issues. However, I believe it would be remiss of me not to highlight matters that fall within the jurisdiction of this committee that have received growing attention in the media and are likely to escalate further as we emerge from these difficult times. Issues that you might wish to explore further, probably in the very near future, the first is the significant impact that the pandemic has had on older people, which has brought the issue of age discrimination very much to the fore. Legislation is required to protect people in Northern Ireland from age discrimination when accessing goods, facilities and services, and that includes health and social care, basically to afford them the same rights and protections as older people enjoy across the rest of the UK. The executive did undertake public consultation on the proposed legislation way back in 2015 and it would be timely to probably revisit that now and I know it is in the uh, new, deal, new approach however um, it hasn't sort of been prioritised as yet. And the second area that you might want to keep your eye on really is in relation to the significant lack of data that's currently available across a number of different equality groupings. And the effect of this pandemic will be around for such a long time that we all need to understand both the current and the future effect on the different equality groups. So it's something that you might wish to uh, keep your eye on and maybe investigate a little bit further. So I will leave you with those matters. Um, hopefully that combined with the briefing notes has given you a good insight into what we're doing. Um, and we're happy to talk to you about any of those matters again in the future, maybe at a more appropriate time. And just to say thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today, and we're both happy to take any questions. 
Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, appreciate the, the presentation. Um, we'll progress to questions. I would have maybe two questions that I would have and then I'll pass to the Deputy Chair and then pass on to members. Um, we've just received um, a briefing from the junior ministers from the department uh, on issues relating to Brexit. And as part of that, uh, you, you would have the ability to... Um, to, to submit proposals to the specialised committee um, on issues to do with the Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol. Have you been developing any proposals at present or submitted any to date? Well, in reality, what has been happening is um, the Chief Executive Evelyn, along with the Human Rights Commission, have been having discussions in relation to this. So if you don't mind, I'll hand it over to Evelyn to answer on this particular point, if that's OK with you. Yes, certainly, certainly. Thank you and good afternoon, committee members and, and chair. Um, we have, of course, welcomed the commitment in Article 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol to no diminution of rights, safeguards and equality of opportunity um, that results from the UK's withdrawal from the EU, including in respect of the protection against discrimination, and will be undertaking, together with the Human Rights Commission, um, a role as part of what's called a dedicated mechanism to provide independent oversight of the, um, that commitment that will involve monitoring, advising, reporting and enforcement activities and powers and duties in respect of that was provided for in the um, Schedule 3 of the 2020 EU Withdrawal Act. Um, you pointed out that in Article 14 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol there is provision for us along with the Human Rights Commission um, of Northern Ireland and indeed the Joint Committee of Representatives of the Human Rights Commission of Northern Ireland and Ireland. And there is a provision to enable us to refer matters to the specialised committee of relevance, matters of relevance to Article 2, the non-diminution um, article. Um, and we are at early stages yet of planning the work of the dedicated mechanism generally and discussions with NIO are ongoing in relation to resources for the role. Um, we, we are anticipating receiving additional resources to do this new work um, and planning is at an early stage, but we'll be picking up pace over the coming period. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, maybe just to reiterate that we have not been having meetings with the Specialised Committee as yet. Yes. And there has been no detail as to how those meetings uh, would be convened or when they might be convened. Okay. Okay, that's great. It was just for because we were discussing how uh, earlier how we might find out this sort of information. So we thought we would just ask yourselves when you're with us. So it was timely to have you uh, on after the junior ministers. Um, no, absolutely, and, and actually, it's a very important role we anticipate playing. It's obviously it, it's um, complementary to the role we play generally under statute in terms of promoting a college opportunity and challenging discrimination. Certainly, the Commission has, and indeed the Human Rights Commission has been very consistent in calling for no diminution of rights and equality as a result of Brexit. So we appreciate having this formal role and also having the role to refer matters as relevant to the Specialised Committee. Excellent. Uh, um, I was going to say, uh, and, and, and it's, it's been good to hear from you today in terms of some of the equality issues that are uh, underpinning some of the difficulties within the coronavirus. And, that, um, and I think that's something that maybe as time progresses, we will need to, to give uh, serious attention to and maybe come back and have a further um, discussion with you once we move maybe beyond um, the sort of immediate pressing health response, but once we um, get the urgent out of the way, I think some, some of what we need to discuss will be just how people have been impacted because of a lack of equality. But notwithstanding the coronavirus um, issues that are, are, are at present, what, are the, what is the greatest challenge towards equality in Northern Ireland, as I say, outside of the, the coronavirus issue um, at the present time? Okay, well, Evelyn will respond to this. Well, we still see, and, and we're still seeing inequalities apparent across many areas of public policy, for example, education, housing, participation in public life, employment. Um, and we've had recommendations, um, you know, research to evidence the key inequalities there and recommendations to um, encourage change. We also see um, significant gap now in legislative protections from discrimination. Um, that have developed between here 
and the rest of, of the UK since the Equality Act 2010 has been enacted. Jeremy McGaffey, the chair, our chair, mentioned in her opening remarks the importance of protection against age discrimination in receipt of goods, facilities, and services. That's a gap that's been existing for over a dec for nearly a decade now, um, and an important lack of protection that needs to be addressed here. But there are also other gaps in protection that were introduced in Britain in the 2010 Act that relate to people with disabilities, that relate to the gender ground, and indeed the race ground too. So certainly there's a challenge in having adequate legislative protection. And uh, we'd also like to see, thirdly, and maybe I'll stop there, we'd like to see much more effective implementation of the statutory duties arising from Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act. We produced a review a couple of years ago um, that showed that there is sufficient attention being played to ensuring effective implementation of those duties, and we've been engaged in raising the profile of the duties again and trying to encourage leadership um, from the senior civil service and now ministers um, in relation to implementing the, in relation to paying due regard to the need to promote equality. So that's a challenge too, and any, any help you can give us with those particular challenges we would be very much appreciative of. Okay, th thank you very much for that. I'll pass to the um, Deputy Chair, to Doug. Um, Children, uh, Evelyn, thank you very much for uh, your presentations, Doug Beatty um, uh, and then the Deputy Chair. Um, I thought I would just maybe just ask a very broad question and just your thoughts on this, uh, because, I mean, there's so much going on now with, with Brexit, with COVID and various other things. We, we kind of forgotten a little bit about the New Deal, uh, the new decade, new, new, new approach um, in, in many ways. But can I just sort of get your thoughts on, on uh, how you think the new changes to the Petition of Concern are likely to work, particularly any role you think you will have uh, on the 14-day um, trigger period uh, once a, a Petition of Concern has been called? Uh, that's interesting. It's not something that we have given a lot of consideration to at the moment. Um, and it's something that we would prefer to come back to you on because uh, it is something that really does require and is worthy of some more sort of in-depth um, consideration of and reviewing um, sort of the legislation and the, the proposals in more detail. So if it's okay with you, Doug, can we come back to you on that yeah, with no, a written response? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it was, a, it was a very general question anyway, just to get your thoughts on it, but we can pick them up, I'm sure, at a later, later stage. But can I then just ask another general question, and, and this will probably be very dear to your hearts. I mean, your, your funding is being cut, um, uh, and, and the cut to your funding is, is affecting staff, and that will affect uh, output. Could you give us an idea of, of, of that funding gap that you are now finding yourselves with? Uh, do, do you want me to be here all day? Uh, because it's something that's really, really um, causing a lot of pressure. Like over the past sort of ten years, like our staffing has been cut by you know fifty percent. Uh, our budget is way down to just over five million. Um, Evan, do you have the, the data there off the top of your head as to how much that actually relates to? It is very, very significant, um, and we end up working through the year basically with an eye on the, on the budget as everybody else does, but having to cut back on work programmes. We have to be very, very um, precise in terms of how we spend that money and what we plan to do in a year. But as we currently stand, we haven't had our budget confirmed for the current financial year, although we are hopeful that that will come very, very soon. But we will have some serious problems if we haven't got it by June. But I think Evelyn has more detail for you in terms of the actual financial figures. Um, well, um, you know, a decade ago, or just over a decade ago, before um, public expenditure started to constrain, our budget was um, well over seven million, and um, it had been consistently at that level for you know, much of the decade. Prior to that, um, for last financial year, it was just over five million, and um, so a decline of you know third, over a, about a third overall. I should, of course, have mentioned that when the chair asked me what the challenges were, because it is a significant challenge managing um, to deliver our services with such a reduced um, budget over the years. Clearly, the reduction in budget has had consequences for what we can deliver in the context where the demand for our services is high. The briefing paper um, highlights that you know 3,600, 4,000 people each year 
are contacting us for um, potential for advice about potential complaints of discrimination. We have all the public authorities that we advise about their equality duties. There's over three and a half thousand employers registered under the Fair Employment um, for, for the purpose of Fair Employment Monitoring. So a significant amount of demand that we, we um, provide a public service to, as well as seeking to try and speak into the public policy debate. And because the structure of our budget then, the majority of it um, goes on the cost of staffing, that's where we've had to um, make the savings. So um, compared to 11 years ago, um, at the end of March there, we had less, just under 70 staff compared to 138 um, over a decade ago, which is um, a reduction of about half. So that clearly has an impact on the scale of what we can do to address inequalities in Northern Ireland. And, and I guess everybody's um, salami slicing their budgets at the minute, and and, uh, and, and of course I know you appreciate you have to do um, similar. But could could you maybe just very very briefly is there anything you could sort of quickly outline that you can no longer provide as a service that you were previously? Just very briefly. It relates to things like promotional activities, which we might once have used advertising to raise awareness of equality issues. We simply would not be doing that anymore. We're doing a lot more. Um, on the website, um, we would have previously run more face-to-face -face training events, conferences, and so on. We've cut back significantly on that. We, of course, scrutinise all expenditure carefully, but there are there are, are specific things like that that we have had to cut back on and think of different ways to deliver. So, um, like everybody across the public service, not hard copies of advice documents and so on. But those are things that are manageable. That it's a lot of the face-to-face. Um, engagement that we would have had, we've had to cut back. And for example, the company wanted staff, all its staff trained. We used to be able to do that. Now we simply don't have the staff to be able to train within individual companies. So we get companies together in a different way. So that is the nature of the, of the changes we've made over the last decade. Uh, and, and, and that's very clear. Th thank you. Um, thank you both. Uh, thank you for all you do uh, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to bring Emma in next because I know that you had indicated that you um, previously about wanting to come in given you're chairing a committee here in, in, in Stormont that's relevant to that. So are you there, Emma, and would you like to ask your question next? Thanks, Colin. Um, I hadn't even realised that I had indicated that, but um, I, I do have some questions. <laughs> I was covering questions. for you. I was covering for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, for the for the presentation and for the the wee paper, and um, I know it had, had given a good overview of, of the work that the commission had done. But I was just had some questions specifically around what's happening in in the current crisis. I know that obviously we all as MLAs are probably receiving the same sorts of queries, um, particularly from workers um, who perhaps had initially uh, found it a struggle to get their employer to to close up or to manage PPE and social distancing properly and, and getting uh, an abundance of queries over the, the course of the past weekend now in terms of uh, PPE and worries about social distancing within factories that are, are coming back to work. And obviously I've been on the on the HSE and asking that inspections are carried out. But I just wondered, you'd mentioned there about um, your role in advising em employees and employers and the, the contact that you'd had. And I just wondered, Particularly uh, within, if you, if you look at the, the groups that are considered by Section 75, and um, so you know, maybe women in the workplace or older people in the workplace, the sorts of uh, queries that you're getting and how you're dealing with it. Yeah, um, as I said earlier, um, the advice um, lines are still very much open, and officers are responding to any queries that they get. Like, for example, over the six weeks from the 23rd of March to the 11th of May, we had uh, a total of 211 calls. 150 of one, one of those were about employment. But I have to say, only 88 were in relation to um, treatments that people have received in respect of COVID-19. And they have all been about employment issues. For example, um, there were concerns from some about the consistency of treatments uh, of employees with respect to furlough and redundancy schemes and a number of specific concerns raised by both disabled workers and pregnant workers as well yeah. as some um, re requests for information and a gui a guidance and advice about educational provision especially for disabled children of key workers 
like some of the things would be where maybe a pregnant worker was asked to take sick leave rather than uh, be furloughed. Um, there was issues about um, face masks and disabled people not being able to understand what's being communicated to them. Um, lack of thoughts being given as to how uh, people who need to wear face masks can overcome issues about trying to communicate with the people that they need to be communicating with. So there's a whole range of things. So as a result of that, we have updated the guidance notes that are on our website, both for employers and employees. And we will continue to update those and amend them as this whole situation evolves. Now, what we're also doing is keeping um, a track of some of these complaints and mm -hmm. categorizing them slightly differently so that we can identify readily which ones are specifically related to COVID-19. And on our website, um, basically all of the communications that we've issued, um, we are publicizing how people can contact us. We are encouraging people to contact us because I think it's important for us, for you and for all of the uh, public sector and private sector that's had to adapt their services, that people understand the implications and the consequences of those actions. So it's something that we're very mindful of and something that officers are working really hard to keep tracking um, and give it good advice and guidance and hopefully get issues resolved before they escalate any further. But um, we will be able to keep you appraised of that over the next wee while. Thanks. That, that, that's helpful, um, and I think it's to be encouraged. I just noted on your website, um, you've got a section dedicated to um, sort of responsibility during yeah. COVID-19 and, and developing policies. And I, I know you, you stated there that perhaps if an EQA has to be done with a consultation um, period would be would be shorter. I'm hoping that that wouldn't mean that it would be any less stringent or that you know any anything would be compromised and yeah. they're not uh, absolutely not um you know a lot of this information is readily available and people who are writing policy documents public policy are well aware of all policy issues but it's just keeping those to the forefront of your mind and i think everybody recognizes that time constraints time limits etc you have to be flexible with those in this present environment we need decisions taken very very quickly no one's going to complain about that but if you don't pay due regard and don't give recognition to the fact that there are people with special needs, uh, whatever they might be across the equality groups, then that's where problems are going to arise. Yeah, um, I think, sorry. I'm sorry. I think the important point, as Geraldine is saying, is that the duties are continuing duties. They, they, they need to be complied with our, our note. Um, was trying to be helpful to those who are working at pace in relation to this, but it is clear that the duties continue to apply and that they are important duties. And actually, as Geraldine said in the introduction, the equality law framework around the duties should be helpful in addressing impacts and you know, understanding and taking mitigating measures as necessary when policies are being developed. Does that help, Thank Emma, you, or is there anything else that uh, can we can add? It, it does, and Chair, if you'll indulge me, just one other thing, because I know obviously there's been a lot of furor in recent days about care homes, and um, I myself have been contacted by uh, residents' families, and obviously then you would you touch yourself on the sort of gap within our legislation in terms of older residents, and I know you mentioned as well the NDNA uh, commitment to, to strategy around that, and that's hopefully something we'll be able to pick up on um, post this crisis, but. I just know that obviously then with the with the condensing of the virus within those sorts of institutions or, or sites, you're going to have potentially a, a, an increase in, in cases amongst older people who are obviously vulnerable. And then as well, the fact that generally speaking, people in caring roles tend to be women and just the worry that, you know, it's going to dispropor disproportionately affect uh, women and older people. So I just think it's something maybe to be mindful of, and obviously you guys are, are, are working on that and tracking it. So, um, yeah, we're, we're very conscious of the fact. That's why I mentioned to you um, in my uh, opening remarks about mm -hmm. the health and social care and the decision making uh, that's taken place in that sector. Uh, we have written to the health minister. We've written to the chief executives of all the health trusts. 
and we are being uh, very, um, how do you say, observant of what's being reported. Um, it's a bit early to start proper investigations and gather evidence, but we are uh, keeping an eye on what's happening and. We are working with the um, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and we will be working with the Commissioner for Older People as well. But, you know, you've heard it said already, older people here in Northern Ireland are at a disadvantage by not having protective legislation, um, as they do across the rest of the UK. So um, it's something I think that there will be a lot of um, coverage on over the next few while. Absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Evelyn and Geraldine. Thanks, Chair. Okay, um, Trevor. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, Geraldine, Evelyn, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was going to make the same sympathetic noises as Doug made about the uh, cuts to your budget. <laughs> Quite now, I think you'd get a sympathetic ear from anybody around this table in that respect. Think again. I'm wondering to, to what extent that affects your ability to operate, frankly. I'm mean, looking at your uh, legal services section of your pre written presentation here. Huh? And you uh, you supported seventy two legal cases last year. Yeah. If 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 some high profile cases came along which were going to cost a lot of money, would you still have the ability to deal with them at the present time? Not necessarily. Um, we would have to prioritise what we do. Um, I think the document actually set out that we have um, a, a systematic approach to how we select what we're going to support moving forward. And it's done on a staged process whereby we agree to um, seek a, an opinion as to the merits of the case and then it's reviewed periodically by committees uh, until it actually gets settled. But if there was a very high profile case um, and it offered real strong strategic benefits to the organisation and to the whole concept of equality or discrimination right across Northern Ireland, I think it would get priority and we would probably have to go cap in hand looking for additional resources at the various monitoring rounds. But we always have to keep a very tight eye on the budget. We try not to let finances dictate what we support and what we don't support. But the reality of it is when you're making those decisions on a fortnightly basis, you are always very conscious how much of a bill am I running up here? What really is the benefit of this item in terms of strategic raising awareness, et cetera? Um, given the fact that we're spending public money. So, you know, any more money that can come our way, we'll be like every other public sector organisation with our hands out, um, and you won't have to ask us or offer it twice. Mm -hmm. If that helps, Trevor? That, that does help, yes. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at your, your workload here. You've got extra duties with the withdrawal agreement with COVID-19, and I presume uh, that the rest of your, your workload and casework is increasing as well all to be dealt with by half the staff that you had on 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, it, is, it is hard um, to keep going. Um, we have a very dedicated staff. Um, and I, I think from what I can see, they do a lot more hours than they're actually paid to do. But um, they are committed to what they're trying to deliver. In terms of the dedicated mechanism, um, Evelyn did say to you when she was speaking to the subject that when we were having um, early discussions with NIO, etc. We did say that we would um, agree to get involved in this only if we had sufficient resources to take it forward. So those kind of discussions are still ongoing. There's no clarity yet as to how much will be available to us. But we believe that's coming from um, Westminster as opposed to from the mm. Northern Ireland budget. So we wait and see what that might deliver. Well, I hope things improve for you. Thanks very much. You do a great thank job. You, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Martina? Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Geraldine and, and Evelyn. Uh, good to hear from you again. I would just like to pick up on the point that was made around Article 2 about the dedicated mechanism in the Withdrawal Agreement Act. And with Christopher in the room, just to be reinforcing the point that the Withdrawal Agreement Act was signed off by Boris Johnson. Uh, uh, as opposed to anyone else and the protocol contained within it. Um, the EU labour law, um, I'm, I'm quite keen to have more information on that, particularly how the EU equality directive um, will apply post the, the end of this transition in the context of, of the protocol. Um, the gaps that you mentioned, that you referenced around um, goods and services, 
and particularly the non-diminution of rights, the non-discrimination um, around ethnicity and race. Um, I'm very conscious that if the EU upgrades any of these measures in the context of EU law and how it will still apply under the six directives in the protocol that apply here, um, then the Assembly needs to upgrade its, um, its law accordingly. And I'm wondering what work has been done by yourselves by way of preparation to engage with, uh, with the executive and with the, uh, with the MLAs. And for instance, it would be helpful, I think, for this committee and others to hear um, how you envisage uh, that being taken forward. And I'm very conscious of what you said in the context of your cuts, because when you consider the um, discrimination um, advice officers that took over 4,000 calls from people who believed they were discriminated against and the highest um, grounds about which people raised complaints was disability. Um, across our society, people with a disability being discriminated against as well as you said about age discrimination and the most vulnerable in our society are older people in the context of COVID-19. So all of those issues are issues that you have a monitoring role, the enforcement role that you have in the dedicated mechanism is interested, interesting because even though your budget has been cut, you mentioned um, Treasury, British Treasury allocating funding to that dedicated mechanism so that that full implementation of the protocol around rights uh, for yourselves will be able to be enforced. So it would be helpful, I know we're not going to be able to do it justice today, Chair, but perhaps um, a more dedicated engagement with yourselves and the, and the Human Rights Commission to understand further how that dedicated mechanism is going to roll out, given that we are only seven months away from the end of this transition. Okay. It's, it's Evan here, Martina. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I hope I got it all. At the, 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 um, it, it's not that easy to hear. Um, certainly, you're right to identify that the um, provisions in relation to rights of individuals in order to make explicit mention of the six um, equality of six of the um, directives relating to equality, um, and there is an intention that as any amendments to those are made at EU level, that um, consequent changes would be met, made in the Northern Ireland context. Um, of course, we haven't seen any changes at European Union level at present, um, uh, but that will be kept track of, and we will need to monitor that carefully. The issue of um, protecting people against age discrimination in respect of goods and services, as you know, is not covered by um, EU law, despite the many years of, of um, people campaigning at EU level for um, a horizontal directive to provide protection beyond the ground space in relation to um, goods and services. So that's not necessarily something that would be corrected by, um, by any, any change there. But certainly, we keep a track um, on that. Um, and on the issue of um, resources that we understand is under active discussion with, between the NIO and Treasury, and we have been impressing ourselves in the Human Rights Commission um, the importance of money both being adequate and being provided in a timely manner so that we can actually recruit and set up dedicated staff to um, undertake this very important work. But very happy to come back to the committee. Um, no, um, just, just I'm sorry that I lumped all the questions in together because I'm very conscious of the fact that age discrimination is actually the gap is happening here. Yeah, uh, in this administration, um, not, not by this current administration, but it's, uh, it's because of previous administrations here not taking that forward around goods and services. And I think that there's something that this committee should look at because I would, I, I hope that in the new administration that there would be more of an attitude uh, to try to address that so that the gap is not particularly around age discrimination for, for yeah. goods and services and that we can uh, plug that gap but I was just trying to capture all of the questions in one. Yeah, thank you, Martina. Can I just maybe suggest that we would be happy to come back to a future meeting with whatever additional information you require around that dedicated mechanism and how the Equality Commission will be fitting into that and what we're planning to do in terms of moving forward, if that's helpful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next is Christopher. Hello there, and, and thank you for your your uh, contribution thus far. 
Um, did I hear you right that, that you have 70 staff? Uh, 68. 68. Full time equivalent. Some of them are part time. Okay. Um, while I was um, listening to Martina's interesting theory about Brexit, I looked up the annual report of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, which operates in England and Wales, and it has 196 staff. Yeah. The Equality and Human Rights Commission has the combined functions of the two commissions that we have here, but covers a jurisdiction of 58 million people. You have more than a third of their staff, and you cover a jurisdiction of 1.9 million people. Do you not see there's a bit of a discrepancy there? Um, thank you very much. Um, it, 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 of course, you can. It's a demonstrable difference in terms of per capita spend. And um, but the issue really, I think, for the executive and the executive committee is what value does it put on ensuring that it has an effective equality body in Northern Ireland providing the range of services that we do to address the inequalities and promote equality here in Northern Ireland. And that's been the focus to date as opposed to a comparison. And I'm not, I'm not aware that other bodies are compared in terms of per capita spend. Um, it's one way to look at it. But certainly from our perspective, the importance is that we have sufficient resources to undertake the statutory role we have but, uh, in the Northern context. I presume you're not suggesting that the, Europe, the Equality and Human Rights Commission in England and Wales isn't providing sufficient well, cover? It, it is, of course, um, and um, as you said, it covers human rights um, as well as equality issues. Um, I, I wasn't suggesting that at all. And obviously, England and Wales have a combined body that covers equality and human rights. Why shouldn't we? That's again absolutely a matter for the executive. The way the statutory um, limits have been, the, the framework have been um, developed over the years, has been the establishment of a separate equality commission and human rights commission, um, and that is um, as provided by the Northern Ireland Act, um, and that's just the difference in, in the way things are arranged here. I appreciate that you're, you're probably not in a position to answer the question, but it would be interesting to know what the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission staff total is, because if, if it was, say, half of yours, that would bring you up to close to 100 staff covering 1.9 million people, whilst 58 million people in England and Wales are being covered by 196. So when other members of this committee um, sort of weep over your lack of resources, I think England and Wales um, provides an accurate comparison. But look, thanks for your time anyway. Thank you. Well, come back to you on this Friday evening. Thank you. Um, Pat, are you online there? Um, still, do you yes. have any questions you'd like to ask there? Yes, I would indeed. Uh, uh, Colin, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Just go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure whether I was on mute or not. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, Darlene Nevin, for your presentation. I suppose I just wanted to concentrate on the the impact of of the COVID nineteen pandemic. And if it has done one thing, it has uh, thrown into sharp relief the health inequalities that exist in, in, in our society. And you've already mentioned yourself the differential impact it has had across society, uh, and particularly in regard to our elderly uh, and disabled citizens. Uh, you know, indeed, I have had to deal with a situation in Muckamore, which houses some of our most vulnerable citizens and the, the situation there left a lot to be desired. Thankfully, it has improved, but uh, one wonders if uh, disabled citizens in Muckamore have been discriminated against as a result of policy decisions taken uh, at a higher level. However, um, I, I know you said that you're keeping an eye on what's going on and that you've written to the health minister uh, uh, but that is probably too early at the moment to carry out investigations. But do you not think it's important that an organisation like your own flags up publicly concerns they may have about potential discrimination uh, across society? Yeah, um, we, we do very much. And we have been emphasising in any of our public uh, communications the importance of equality and the importance of looking after the vulnerable in our society and emphasising the various equality groups. 
when I said about it being a little bit too early to investigate, what we're being very, very mindful of is that our communications should contribute to um, assisting in the current climate and the current difficulties rather than being seen as white noise or hot air or actually taken away from the very significant work that the executive has been trying to do in terms of keeping people and society safe. Um, that doesn't diminish what we know is going on in terms of the impact on the elderly and the vulnerable disabled in our society. We're very, very conscious of that, which is why we have written to the Minister and to the Chief Executive of the Health Trust re-emphasising the importance of the equality framework, the need to keep people involved in making decisions about their own care. Um, there is a, a Commissioner for Older People who has been very articulate in the media in terms of what's happening in home care, uh, care home settings, but um, we have to be mindful of the fact that we don't have a role primarily in this, um, discrimination against elderly people or older people. But we have been very vocal in terms of disabled people um, and encouraging the Minister to ensure that disabled people are involved in decisions about their care, that they are involved in the development of policies about care issues. So uh, we will continue to work and be very vocal in this regard. I did say to you earlier on in my opening remarks about the fact that we support the executive and commit to supporting the executive moving forward and for all the work that they've done in this crisis. But, and I did stress the but, we will use our powers and our voice to raise issues where we believe there's a serious equality issue. And, you know, we will take that very seriously moving forward, but I wanted to reassure you that that would be the case. Yeah, and, 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 that, and that's definitely very welcome. And, and you also mentioned the lack of data uh, that's coming out across a number of equality groups, and of course, one of the areas where there is serious concern about the data or lack of it is in the care home setting uh, and as well as elderly people there are many disabled people also affected in all of this and it's difficult i mean you can see yourself uh, in the media presentations that there isn't uh, any sort of definitive idea about the numbers of people who have died in homes in care homes there's no data around the number of people who have been transferred to hospitals, referred to hospitals from care homes, and there's no information about the numbers of people who died after being referred to hospitals. So, I mean, does the Equality Commission have a role in perhaps trying to tease out that particular type of data? Well, it's definitely here. Um, certainly, we have um, been promoting the need to collect equality disaggregated data, data um, including on disability, for example, and older people. The, the Section 75 duties that we've referred to actually cover nine grounds, as, as you'll know, um, and the information that we're getting most, um, or the areas that we're getting most information about currently in relation to the impact of COVID is age and gender, and we're not getting as much information as we need to about impact on people with disabilities or other categories like black and minority ethnic communities which are important and um, so that's where our role is that for the purposes of um analyzing and being used to inform decision making in relation to COVID, that equality disaggregated data is um is vital um, but of course health service generally will want to know at what stage and all the data that you have on pipelines so that they can track and trace by the virus is spreading, I absolutely um, appreciate that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, and, 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 and just finally, I want to ask you a more general sort of policy or strategic type of question. Uh, although it is, it is connected to the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So um, I, I, we've mentioned the health inequalities that exist in society and, and parts of my own constituency in West Belfast the life expectancy for males is eight or nine years less than uh, the same demographic in South Belfast, for example. And many of the the, the people in that in West Belfast are suffering 
uh, disproportionate levels of cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension and so on, which are being flagged up as serious risk factors in, the, in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, those health inequalities uh, are certainly disproportionately affecting the socially and economically disadvantaged. So yeah. coming out of this crisis, there needs to be a broader discussion about how we reduce those inequalities in society in general. And what role do you see for the Equality Commission in all of that? Do you see yourselves as having a voice in that? Very much so, Pat. Um, as I said earlier on, we will be issuing statements. We will be carrying out research and investigation to actually highlight the inequalities that are emerging or the inequalities that are being exacerbated by this whole process and the response to it. We have, um, presently we have key inequality statements in relation to health, to housing, education, um, right across the whole spectrum. And those statements and recommendations are based on very detailed research, um, stakeholder engagement, public opinions, etc. And they're designed to inform policy makers where things need to change. And I think if you were to list any of those key inequality papers at the minute, and read them again in light of what's happening over the past six, seven, eight weeks, you will see how they're all interrelated and why COVID-19 has brought many of those aspects very much under spotlight. Health inequality, housing inequality, they're all there and they're all relevant. Um, and there are people in our society who are suffering greatly. But one of the things that I would highlight to you is that we can only look at data through um, a poverty perspective um, or a lens, we don't have the authority or the power or the barriers to actually go out and talk about poverty as a key inequality. Um, so we do try to build it in around the, the information that we provide. Um, Evelyn, did you want to add to that? Just to support what you were saying, um, while we don't have barriers um, in relation to poverty per se, we absolutely accept and um, promote awareness of the fact that inequalities based on different grounds like disability or age can be very much exacerbated by poverty um, and that that needs to be paid attention to in public policy terms and in public service delivery terms. Um, it's a very important point that you know inequalities are exacerbated by poverty. There's no doubt about that. And another thing I think that's worth noting too, um, albeit that it might fall under the remit of the um, Education Committee, I think the uh, inequalities that we've previously highlighted in terms of education are really going to come home to roost um, over the next while as well. Like our children are being um, impacted by the fact of homeschooling, etc. It is for everyone's good that that's happening. That's not the issue. But it's what we maybe need to do as a society to help those children catch up. Um, it's very conscious I heard in the media uh, in England, they're talking about creating some kind of a fund or a foundation to assist children, vulnerable children, in terms of catching up with education. So those kind of things um, are maybe something that we should be looking at in a little bit more detail, but we will keep an eye on them, and we will appraise you um, with the various research papers that we produce over the next uh, number of weeks and months. Okay. Thanks very much for that. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Just one moment. George, um, are you still there, and is there any questions? Yeah, Do it have? Still here, Chair. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, just to welcome Geraldine and Evelyn <clears throat> to the committee this, after this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> just w one question, and it's a very critical one, I think. Uh, just asking where, where you're based at the, <clears throat> at the present time and how acceptable, basically, you are because of the crucial role that you have in, in society. And <clears throat> do you have any like, satellite offices throughout Northern Ireland? <clears throat> Those are a couple of questions that... Maybe, maybe you could answer. Thank you, George. It's, it's Evan, the Chief Executive here. Um, our main head, our, our only offices are in um, Equality House in Shaftesbury Square in, in Belfast. Nobody is working there at the moment. We're, we're all working remotely. We're oh, working from home. We're all working remotely, yes. But our advice lines and um, all our services are continuing to be provided. Um, and um, that's as well as I earlier. Um, we're, we're, phone lines are ringing with 
potential complaints with support from employers and, and so on. So mm -hmm. I'm that very very quickly once government advised that where people can work at home, they should be facilitated to do so. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that um, services are being provided. And we have never been able to develop regional offices, but we do when we're not in these extraordinary circumstances. Um, we do certainly um, go out and about Northern Ireland to meet people where they need to be met, um, and we make every effort to make our building accessible to people with all sorts of, of um, disabilities as well as um, as well as non-disabled people. And, and a lot of information people access on our website, which we work hard to keep up to date as a source of information, and we've done a lot of work yeah. over that. I'm sure the, the cuts to your budget it doesn't help the situation either, you know, from an accessible point of view. In terms of the Disability draw. point of view, yes. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Appreciate thank it. You. Okay, thank you very much, George, for those questions. Um, I know there can be a difficulty sometimes during presentations if you ask questions early on that you've got other points that you want to make, and I try to detract from that as we can. That's just you're better off getting your weight into the last, and then you get to encompass it. But I do know the frustrations there, and I know that Martina wishes to make a point, and Christopher makes a point, envisaging that they're likely to be contrary. Can I remind people that the questions and points are to those that are presenting in general and not across the... The committee room, but Martina, did you have something you wished to come in and Well, I suppose that um, neither, neither of the two of you will be surprised to hear that uh, we do not calculate your value based on per capita. Um, England, thankfully, didn't have a government that was only dealing with one section of society, and we're not going to rehearse the legacy of the conflict and the years of discrimination that society has endured. This is about bodies, two bodies. Uh, that's going to address this and take us into a better place. So um, if it was the case that we had a calculation of what was going to be allocated, whether it was investment based on per capita, well, we in the Northwest would be in a lot of be better position, I can tell you, with Invest and I uh, hardly ever coming our way and invest in anything per capita. So I don't think that is, uh, is how you should calculate what you're doing. Looking at the work that you're carrying out here, and particularly, I was really struck with that legal advice and the amount of uh, people who are suffering um, as a consequence of society not actually dealing with them properly, and people who have got a disability uh, coming to yourselves experience and discrimination. I'm sure that's across our society, and I have to say that of all of them, uh, the 47% of the people that you've talked about here and uh, that you've given legal advice to, regardless of their religious denomination, of the colour of their skin, have probably really benefited from the advice that you have given. So well done, and I will support the fact, like George and others, that you do need more working in your actual, yeah, in your commission. Remarkable. Okay, and I think that it's yeah. helpful to keep that as a comment rather than a comment, question. That's Thank all. you very much. Um, Rem remarkable to hear the previous speaker say they don't want to rehearse the legacy of the conflict. Almost every contribution appears to be that. There's an important point that needs to be put on the record. Pat said that there was a difference between West and South Belfast in terms of health inequalities. That's not actually true. There's a vast difference inside my own constituency in terms of health equalities. So the health inequalities experienced by people in the market and in Sandy Row and in Donegal Pass uh, are the same as people in Divis and other places in West Belfast. I, I think it's actually it's an inner city, outer city divide rather than a east, west, north, south divide. And I just wanted to put that on the record because I think it's important. Okay, well, again, I will accept that as a comment rather than... And, yeah. and, 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 um, mm -hmm. Could I, could I just come in with a, a quick comment there? Uh, I don't think it was deliberate. I don't think you were. I don't think you were trying to be okay, smart or anything. I don't just think. sometimes going into my statistics bigger than yours is not. The, if we're thinking of different perspectives, but people can, of course, uh, illustrate their point with facts that they have to hand. But Pat, you're looking just a quick comment there. Just, just a quick comment, and, and and I made the point that it's only in parts of West Belfast that that lower life expectancy uh, persists and I should have said that uh, it's eight or nine years lower than parts of South Belfast yeah, that's fair so enough. just to clarify that that's, good. Thank fair you, enough. that's, that, that's helpful um, Geraldine and Evelyn can I thank you very much for your um, 
attendance here uh, at the, the meeting this afternoon. It's been great to get the update on it. It's very informative for new members on the committee and um, I know that we will take an opportunity maybe to invite you back again to investigate some other areas of your, your work there that you mentioned. So thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, members, for your interest. And we look forward to seeing you face to face maybe next time. Maybe. Hopefully. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Chair, I think just to wrap up, see what Christopher is saying about where the inequalities are is crucially important because regardless of where they are, you know, I will stand up and defend uh, the need for Christopher's constituency to get resources as much as I will defend Pat's resources. If, uh, we're dealing with NISRA statistics that show us where the areas of needs are. So maybe that is something that would be helpful for this committee to actually have them, some information around NISRA and as to where they are, because it doesn't matter where they are. It's about well, addressing them collectively together and us ensuring in those areas where we can have common ground. Uh, we can push those issues of in, you know, inequality, whether it's health, education, wherever they are, let's try and tackle them. I don't disagree with that, but just one example in terms of the NISRA statistics. Takmona is in the Upper Malone Ward. Yeah, I know. Well, and I, I have many examples in my own yeah. area as well. Yeah. That, that yeah. get drawn down, but that, so yeah. But I think that's probably, I think we're actually, we're nearly coming from the same, the same perspective, and that is how we make sure that a, the, the, the NISRA definition of an area doesn't impede somewhere yeah. from actually getting what's required. Um, am I getting the sense that you want to actually commission some sort of our research people to gather that information on the, the areas. Yeah, that might be and, and obviously we'd all know we where there are the differences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, members, uh, following the presentation then we are, um, if we can move on to item 7, the forward work programme. What page that on? On page 53 of the meeting pack. Um, we have the... Uh, sorry. the oh, sorry, was there something on the... The menu's Oh, did I jump over it? Yes, provision. Yes. Item six. Sorry, I'm not You just want this to end. <laughs> <laughs> the function of government? Yes. No. Yes. Seven. Seven. Okay. Sorry, it's on this one here. Yeah, um, okay, so um, it's on page 32 uh, of the meeting pack. Um, members, that uh, we are expected to consider clauses of the bill which are relevant to the executive office. So we will therefore focus on those elements which relate to executive ministers and the special advisors in the executive office and report findings to the Committee of Finance, which is the la lead responsibility for the committee stage of the bill. Annex A at page 34 of the meeting pack that you have provides commentary on the 12 main causes, all of which are of concern to this committee. Um, now, we had requested written evidence um, on the bill from the Executive Office. We had asked them for that, uh, and that evidence will be considered at next week's meeting to identify whether any further information is required or whether any further ev evidence sessions should be scheduled. On Annex B uh, of the Clerk's Paper, page 37, the meeting pact is a draft timetable for the committee consideration of the bill. Are members content to note the draft timetable that is there? Yes. Okay, and that will involve then us being able to schedule some uh, items for people going forward. Chair, yes. I wouldn't want to speak out of turn, but I think the discussion on the 1st of July, agree committee position on the bill will be an interesting day. <laughs> Since we have had discussion on committee already. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see how we get, we get there. Um, item 7, uh, the Forward Work Programme, again, is on page 53 of the meeting pack. Next week we have the uh, first Deputy First Minister um, on the Department and the Executive's response to the COVID uh, pandemic. And then we also have the Community Relations Council uh, who will provide an overview briefing as well. In the Forward Work Programme there are a number of other items that are there for the weeks going ahead. Are members content to note the Forward Work Programme? Yes. Yep. Okay. No. Yep. Pat, were you looking at something there? No, no, I'm content with that. Okay, good, excellent. Um, item eight is correspondence. Uh, there are two items of correspondence in the meeting pack in relation to the function of government bill. Um, on page 59 is item 8.1, which is a copy of the correspondence from the finance 
uh, committee to our cell, uh, to ourselves um, requesting further information on the bill and item 8.2 on page 61 is a copy of the correspondence from the committee of standards and privileges to ourselves requesting information Oh, it's not us, it's the, the, the executive office requesting information on specific clauses to the bill. Are members content to note both pieces of correspondence? Yes. Okay. Uh, there is no chairman's business, uh, which is okay. item nine. Sorry, I have three copies of this. I don't know why I have three copies. They're all different of the chairman's brief today. Uh, okay, there is chairman's uh, business on this brief that I have. Um, yes. We have um, the coronavirus amendment regulations on Tuesday. Um, as members will remember from before, the Health Committee has been taking the lead on the implementation of these, um, and the regulations were led them, but they and were scrutinised by the Health Committee. But the Department of Health had asked uh, that the TEO lead the debate in the Health Minister's stead. So, um, as is convention, I will be called after the junior ministers to give. Uh, uh, some remarks. This is effectively about the changes that were made to the regulations to enable the opening of graveyards and um, also by ensuring the need for social distancing. So it's a very small uh, change that there was. Okay, to so when, it. I, when I looked at the, the, at the papers, the business papers, I thought it was the health minister. It's up, so it's not actually. It's the two junior it's ministers. The, it's the, and the junior it's ministers. The CEO. Okay. Yep. Okay, members happy um, enough for that position to be taken yep. then? Yes. Okay. Any other business? None. Nope. Um, then date, time, place of next meeting will be here again this time next week at two o'clock in room thirty. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, members. Thanks Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly okay, Committee you. Room thirty? Okay. Thank you. Bye. This is.